All right. Thank you, ladies, very, very much. Take your Bible and go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's reread these three verses. We'll read many other verses in just a moment. But the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Again, faith can be added to. I'm going to show you in just a minute. I like to rehearse this because it, does, it, it really encourages people to understand that there's different levels of faith. And uh, I covered that, I think, in a Wednesday night Bible study not long ago or whatever, uh, to help us to understand that you may not always have a great faith, you may not always have a full faith. Uh, your faith can quickly change. And sometimes it quickly changes with an event that challenges you or whatever the case may be. But we understand this, according to the scriptures, that you can add to your faith. It says here, virtue and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, if you'll permit me for the next little while, I want to speak tonight on a tested faith. Now, I don't want you to get confused tonight about how a faith gets tested and compare that to the time that you experience having a little faith or a great faith, etc. There's five faiths that we have taught on that is found in your Bible, and only five, I believe, that's mentioned in your Bible. We see the disciples are facing a raging, stormy sea, and Jesus is asleep in the hinder part of the ship. Mark chapter 4 and verse 40, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, he's talking again to the disciples. He's talking, if you would please, to those that traveled with him, slept beside the spoken word of God by the fire at night, saw miracle after miracle. He said, you have no faith. Then you see, of course, speaking to the disciples again on how God could care for them. Uh, that is what they're questioning. The Lord Jesus answers back about how God can care for them. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 30, the Bible says, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye, of little faith? Now again, these are the disciples. So you have two examples that have no faith, they have little faith. Then you see there's another example about the disciples found in the book of uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, where uh, they're having struggle with that which is forgiveness, the action of forgiveness. And so they're coming to the Lord. They're saying, you know, this is a difficult thing for us to understand how we can practice forgiveness. Uh, Luke chapter 17 and verse 5, uh, the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. So they're saying this is a hard thing. It's hard to forgive people. Now I'm going to tell you something. If it was hard for the disciples that saw miracle after miracle to forgive people, if it was hard for the disciples to be able to understand, grasp, and practice forgiving people, and they had that which is the Lord Jesus right beside them, it's also going to be a challenge for you, okay? And so he says to that which is the disciples, he says this, uh, he says that this was a time where they needed an increased faith. You see that with their plea, with their question, with them asking, and they're saying increase our faith, all right? So they needed more faith. So they're coming to the only one that can increase their faith. That's the Lord Jesus, the spoken word of God, faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So they're coming to that which is Jesus, the spoken word of God, and saying to him, increase our faith. Faith. All right, now that's the disciples. Then you go, of course, uh, from the disciples to that which was the one that had a great faith. He was a centurion, a soldier, if you will, in the military. Never saw, it, uh, uh, as far as we know, recorded. Never saw a miracle. Never traveled with Jesus. But yet the Bible says he had a great faith. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10. The Bible says, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. All right? So here's the centurion, soldier under military ban. And yet the Bible teaches he had a great faith. Give you one more. There was a deacon by the name of Stephen. Deacon means a deacon can have a full faith. 
uh, Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And so here's a deacon. Uh, by the way, as far as we know, never saw a miracle. As far as we know, never traveled with Christ, but yet a deacon that had, if you would please, a great amount of faith that turned into a full faith. Now, I can say this, and I can say this experientially. You can go from having a great amount of faith to no faith, or from a great amount of faith or full faith to that which is a little faith in reasonably a short amount of time. I'll give you an example. You're driving down the road. Uh, or, no, let's say, let me give you a better example. You're riding with somebody. Well, they're driving down the road, okay? As long as they're stopping, as long as they're obeying the signals, as long as they're obeying the speed limit and staying within their lane, you got full faith. <laughs> then all of a sudden, something strikes them. Emergency. I need to drive faster, crazier. Forget the law. And they just start taking off. They're zipping this away, zipping that away. They're running over things. They're running through things. Okay? Your great faith that you had might have just diminished to a little faith. You know? And now you begin to plead out to the Lord. Dear God, help now. Or, or you call, if you would please, dear Lord, save me. You know, you give that call out. All right? So, so faith, faith. And, and don't think bad of yourself. I want to help you. Don't think bad of yourself. If all of a sudden one day you wake up and, uh, and it just seems like that nothing's going right, there's a cloud over your personal head, you're walking out into a miserable world, and it just seems like that everything you touch is going to crumble that day, everything you touch is going to turn to coal, everything that you do is not going to be right. Hey, uh, don't, don't take that personal and don't take it personally out on someone else. It might just be that that day you need a little bit of extra God working in your life and so you need to call out to him, okay? Don't beat yourself up. Simply go to the one that can remedy the problem. Go to the one that can remedy the problem, all right? Now, wait a minute, though. Uh, how is it that sometimes our faith is attacked? Now, you have to exercise your faith. You know, there was the, uh, the Soviet cosmonaut uh, that traveled, of course, out, in the, uh, the, out of, in, into the universal area, out into the orbit. Uh, he was out there 326 days. It was on December the 29th, 1970, or 1987, and he landed. Uh, when he landed, uh, they uh, uh, found out that uh, he was in better shape than astronauts that had traveled Five years earlier, they were only out there 211 days, and that was it. Uh, but when they landed, uh, they had dizziness, they had uh, a heart uh, palpitations, they had uh, high pulse rates, they had lightheadedness, they were weak very much. And so those that were a part of the, the Soviet uh, cosmonaut type of program decided, okay, we know what happened. They weren't exercising while they was there, uh, you know, no gravity, all their muscles were dormant, and uh, they, they had not used their muscles in over 200 days, and so now they were losing muscle uh, density. They were not as strong as what they did. So with this particular astronaut that landed on December the 29th, 1987, what they did is they put rubber bands inside an uh, elastic type of uh, suit that he had on so that when he would stretch, it would also be hard for him to stretch. Uh, when he moved his legs, it would be hard so that it kept those muscles intact. They found out by using your muscles, you don't lose that which is the elasticity or the strength of your muscles. Can I tell you, if you and I get to a point and we get to a place where we do not use the muscle of faith in our life, it becomes dormant. You know, uh, now I thank God that God's blessed us. Boy, I thank God for that. I thank God that some of you live in a nice house. God bless you. Uh, some of you drive nice vehicles. God bless you. Some of you have moved from a four-digit to a five-digit to a six-digit figure a year. God bless you. But do not let your faith become dormant. Do not let your faith go in reverse. Do not let your faith all of a sudden begin to stop being used, all right? Now, I want to give you some reasons why our faith becomes dormant. Why is it that our faith, if you would please, uh, what are some things that will test 
your faith. Let me give you a couple of statements tonight. Statement number one, a tested faith, by the way, listen to me, tested faith, if treated right, will bring about a depth of character. When your faith is tested, by the way, your faith will be tested. If you allow that test to help you, what it's going to do is it's going to give you a depth of character. Romans chapter 5 and in verse 3, the Bible says this. It says, and not only so, it says, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh with patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And the Bible says, and the hope maketh not ashamed because of the love of God that is shed abroad in her hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. All right? So God is teaching here that uh, what is going to help us is tribulation. You say, preacher, I don't like that. I didn't say you like that. But I can tell you tonight that tested faith brings about a depth of character, all right? So all of a sudden, somebody, they're moving along with uh, great ability. Then uh, they lock up their knee. They lock up their ankle. They lock up their shoulder. They lock up, okay? Now, wait a minute. That's a test that's coming your way. Is that going to stop you? Or are you going to rely on God more to help you to make it through the test? There's a relationship challenge that you have in your life. All right? Is that going to stop you? You know, I know people that do this. They said this. They said, look, I got hurt at church many years ago. And because I got hurt at a church, I'm never going to go back to church. And they get hung up because they did not pass the test. I know people that do this. They say, I got hurt in a relationship many years ago. Because I got hurt in a relationship, I'm never going to trust anybody else again. What happened is they failed the test. Uh, I know people that have done this. They say, well, I'll tell you what, it just did not work out the way I wanted it to work out. Well, first off, it should never work out necessarily the way that you want it to work out, but it should work out always the way that God wants it to work out, and he gets all the glory and all the honor. You know, when you get up to sing a song and you fail to remember your line, it's not time to quit. It's time to go back and study the line. A tested faith. A a tested faith brings a depth of character. Statement number two. A a tested faith enables us to comfort and to encourage others. You know, once you go through a trial, is it not true? Once you go through a trial, now you know how to comfort somebody else that's going through the same trial. It's true. You know, uh, once you have, uh, I I remember when I first became allergic to the refined white sugar, and I came across somebody that was having to take shots and and all sorts of other stuff because they were having uh, a chemical imbalance in their life when it came to their health, all right? You know, I could identify with them. Well, sure I could. Sure I could. Because I remember when I was a young child, I used to have to take shots all the way up to about five or six years of age. I'd have to have a shot every day or so. And, and so I could identify with them. Then went from that to have to eat liver. Uh, liver. Liver. Blech. But I remember going through that time of having to eat a lot of that liver to get the iron in my blood and stuff like that. And, and I remember some of those things of many, many years ago. Now, can I tell you this? Uh, I'm saying this, that a tested faith brings a depth of character. A tested faith uh, brings us to the place where we can comfort and encourage someone else. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the Bible says, and the God of all comfort. The Bible says in verse 4, 2 Corinthians 1, 4, the Bible says, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. He said, you're going through tribulation so that you can comfort others that's going through trouble. I remember my daddy being in the hospital and my wife and I would sometimes have the privilege to be able to go and visit my dad in the hospital. Because I was used to being able to comfort people when we lived in Brooklyn, New York and Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And one of my responsibilities as an assistant pastor was I was one of the persons that was uh, 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 given the responsibility by pastor to visit the hospital. 
okay? And after visiting the hospital and standing beside people that were dying, standing beside people that had heartbreak, standing beside people that was just diagnosed with uh, some type of degenerating disease or some type of uh, malfunction of the heart or something like that, uh, after spending so many years of just going to hospitals and going to hospitals and going to hospitals and going to hospitals, uh, you learn how to comfort people in the hospital. You know, they don't want you coming in and feeling sorry for them, most of them. They want you to come in and love them. They want you to come in and comfort them. Uh, my wife and I was able to go by and see Mrs. Stead yesterday. And, and of course, Destiny and, and Rebecca uh, met us up there. And, uh, and as we went uh, to uh, the hospital, we met in the hallway there. A matter of fact, they, they, they tried to scare me. And, and my, I knew something was up. I knew something was up. Uh, my wife had to go to the ladies' room. And she said, can you let me out here in front of the hospital? I said, sure. And so I went and I parked the car and uh, found a place to park the car car. My wife was waiting for me in the lobby area there, and she had this suspicious, that's the word, suspicious look, like something's up. And that means probably she's up to no good. <laughs> so she had this really suspicious look on her face, like, <laughs> I'm going to get you, big boy. You know, one of those looks, you know. And, and so I didn't trust her. When she gets that look on her face, I don't think anybody that has any wisdom ought to trust her. And so she got that look on her face, and I thought, I'm in trouble, but I don't know what. You know, so I'm kind of looking around thinking, okay, who's going to pop out? You know, is she going to have me arrested or something? Or is somebody going to come up and tackle me and take me down and, you know, put my hand behind my back and say, all right, you, you have to say Papa or something. I, I don't know. You know, and so, I, you, know, she, she, you know, she reached out to hold my hand. I thought, okay, she's going to pull me into the lion's den. I don't know where it's at. There's a lion's den somewhere here. So she uh, reached out to hold my hand, and, and then she put her other hand behind me like, okay, now I've got you. You're not escaping, uh, you know? And we kept walking around the corner, and there all of a sudden was these two girls, and they were just kind of like waiting. I don't know if they planned to jump out, and they lost their courage. I don't know what it was, but they got these goober looks on their face like, hi. That's about it. So that was almost painless. Now, what I'm saying is this. I'm saying, you don't know what's around your corner. You have no idea what you're going to face in your future. But whatever you face in your future, you can use it to be able to comfort someone else, to be able to help someone else. You ever get in a situation where it seems like everything is tight and you can take control of the situation and say, look, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. We're going to figure this thing out. We're going to get through it. All right, what I'm saying is you're able to do stuff like that because you've already been there and done that. You've already got the T-shirt. You've already been beside somebody's deathbed, beside somebody's hospital bed. You've already been to the funeral. You've already helped in assisting burying babies. You've already helped and assisted and uh, uh, putting underground somebody that was gunshot or somebody that died on drugs or somebody that died because all of a sudden there was a disease that hit them, and yet uh, they were in perfect health prior to facing that uh, tragedy in their life. Uh, you've been beside the people, if you will please, that's facing the financial reversal. You've been beside the people that all of a sudden has somebody in their house that begins to cause them grief and problems and trouble. You've been beside the people that's having marital distresses. You've been walking beside these people all these many years. And can I tell you, what takes place is this. Uh, it will help you to be able, uh, because you've been through some things, that that testing of the faith will bring a depth of character. It'll happen in your life. That testing of that faith will help you to be able to comfort people and to encourage people. I like the story of, 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 uh, of Eddie uh, Riddenbacher. Eddie Riddenbacher was a famous race car driver right prior to World War I. I mean, he was very good. Uh, after that, he became a pilot in World War I. Because he was so, uh, so agile in the way that he would respond, I mean, his reflexes were absolutely uh, perfect. I mean, he was able to swerve this away and swerve that away. Well, because of that, he became an excellent fighter pilot. And in World War I, he was able uh, to knock out of the sky by shooting down 26 enemy army aircraft. Uh, he was rewarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for shooting down 26 enemy aircraft. 
Uh, after the war, he bought the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and he became the, the head, if you would, the president of Eastern Airlines. In World War II, he was contacted by, the, by President Roosevelt and said, uh, by President Roosevelt in World War II, I don't know of anybody that could do this like you. I want you to carry some instructions to General MacArthur. So he boarded a plane with several others. He took off, and with him, and there was five other people that was heading over, and in the Pacific uh, Sea, the Pacific Ocean, if you will, please, all of a sudden that plane began to malfunction. And that plane went down. That plane went down, and according to the records, uh, one day after another day after another day, uh, they survived. How did they survive? They survived simply because uh, even drifting for three weeks and they ran out of food, but they survived because he kept reading to these men, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, and they started praying for food, and one day he said after reading Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, a seagull landed on his head. He reached up and he grabbed the seagull. He killed the seagull. They ate the seagull. They took the rest of the body parts of the seagull and they made it as fishing bait and they caught enough fish to help them survive the rest of that tragedy where they were out in the middle of the ocean. He attributes all that to God. And he said, it's by God. God is the one that gave me that seagull. God is the one that gave me that written word. It's because that written word was established in my heart. God gave me the victory in World War I. God gave me the victory in World War II. God gave me the victory when we were stranded for three weeks in the middle of the sea. He said, God did that. And then he wrote this. He said, courage is, is doing what you're afraid to do. There's no courage unless you do what you're afraid to do. Now, can I tell you, listen, uh, we can understand this, that we're going to have our, our faith is going to be tested. You're going to go through some testing times. But uh, when your faith is tested, it should enable you to comfort and to encourage other. Statement number next. When your faith is tested, it encourages you to be dependent upon God's wisdom. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm 56 and and being at 56, I learn more now than ever before. I want to be dependent upon the wisdom of God in my life. You know, more than I was when, uh, before I was married and I was a young preacher, oh, do I want that wisdom of God more. If you were to go, I built a private bathroom between my wife. My wife has an office, and hers is set up almost like a living room. If you've ever been to my wife for counseling, uh, there's her office in the hallway right there, right across from the school office almost. And then if you go through, there's a little, little space, a little hallway that goes from her office to my office, and it has a bathroom uh, that we built in there, and I put a shower in there. And so uh, there's a nice bathroom and shower that's in there. If you go inside my bathroom, you look on the mirror. It's going to say two things. They're on yellow 3 by 5 course. To the left of it, it says, pray for God's power. To the right of it, on the bottom of the mirror, it says, pray for God's wisdom. Because I need God's power, and I need God's wisdom. Uh, I don't want to fail you. I don't want to fail my Savior. I realize this. I realize that many of us make decisions based on the messages that are preached from a pulpit. That's a heavy, heavy responsibility. From this pulpit, you hear about how to rear your children. From this pulpit, you hear about finances. From this pulpit, you hear about how to have a personal disciplined life. From this pulpit, you hear about how to increase your faith. From this pulpit, you hear about so many things that we teach that are doctrinal studies from the Bible. So many things that uh, it would boggle your mind about. So, and, and, you know, I as a preacher, man, I, I don't want to get up and waste your time. And I don't want to get up and waste God's time. And I don't want to get up, if you would please, and drop the ball so that uh, you hanging in the balance, getting ready to make a very important decision, do not see from the scriptures what the Bible teaches. See, the Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. 
and it shall be given him. Listen to it, James chapter 3 and verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy, it says, to be, or to, to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. So God says, hey, Mike, here's the way to be able to give wisdom. God says your, your wisdom that you're giving that's from me First, it needs to be pure. By the way, Dad, listen to me. You're trying to give your wife wisdom. You're trying to give your children wisdom. Go to your Bible and find out what the description of wisdom is. Wisdom, first, is pure. Secondly, wisdom is peaceable. Thirdly, wisdom is gentle. Fourthly, wisdom is easy to be entreated. Fifthly, wisdom is full of mercy. Sixth, wisdom is good fruits. Seventh, wisdom is without partiality. Uh, eighth, wisdom is without hypocrisy. So God says, hey, uh, get wisdom from me. Now, listen to the fruit of that. Uh, James chapter 3 and verse 18, the Bible says, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace to them that make peace. All right, so what do you do when all of a sudden there's a couple? What do you do when all of a sudden there's people in the church that have a head on? And by the way, you're always going to have people in the church that have a head on. It's almost like two rams. I would illustrate it, but I don't want to hurt these guys' heads. So I could get Brother Bachman to stand up, and I could get Brother Craig to stand up, and they could stand up, and they could go like this. They could point their heads one to another. Brother Palmore would say, go. They could rush across the platform and knock heads. How many would like to see that? Raise your hand. That would be so fun, wouldn't it? Okay, never mind. Okay. But can I tell you, when they would hit heads, you would hear probably just like the rams, not, not, hopefully their heads is not empty like the ram's horns are, but because there's a, there's a void inside of the ram's horns, you hear the locking of the horns or the clashing, if you would please, of the bones. Now, hopefully, because they've got a lot of brain power in there, you would not hear it clash so much. All right? But what I say is this. You have stuff like that that goes on in churches. Because in churches, you have people that don't see eye to eye. It's because some are shorter than others. That's why. But that doesn't mean you're not supposed to love each other. And that does not mean, look, don't get on each other's nerves. Well, so-and-so said something the other day, and I just sharply disagree. Get over it. In the name of Jesus, get over it. Learn to love each other, forgive each other, help each other, walk beside each other, all for the glory of God. Now, may I say tonight, here's what we understand. Uh, trusted faith, uh, it encourages us uh, to lead, if you will, statement number next, a, a productive and effective life. You know, uh, Franklin, uh, or Benjamin Franklin was never a saved man, as far as I know. Now, if you know something different, you can tell me. But he was never a saved man. Now, he did have an affectionate for the scriptures because he came up in a Christian home. His mom and daddy attended church. He was taught scripture. He always tried to make himself better. So at the age of 20, Benjamin Franklin wrote a list of 13 virtues. And he said, I'm going to take one virtue per week. And I'm going to work on that that week till I can perfect it. So he took temperance. He took silence. He took order. He took... Uh, uh, being somebody that has resolve. He took uh, uh, frugality. He took industry. He took sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and humility. And so for 13 weeks, he would take one of those and he'd work on it for seven days. Then he'd go down his list and take the next one, work on it for seven days. Then he'd take the next one. But you know, uh, all throughout, he said that there was emptiness on the inside. One of his best friends was George Whitfield, was a very good friend. Now understand, Benjamin Franklin was not a saved man. He was a diligent worker. He was always trying to improve himself. Matter of fact, he gave a thousand pounds, which would be equated to uh, uh, $4,400. He gave it to the city of Philadelphia, and he said, here's the stipulation. You're not allowed to use it, and it has to matriculate interest for 200 years. 
And after 200 years, you can take it out. He was a planner. And after 200 years, the, uh, uh, the city of Philadelphia received a check for $5 million from Benjamin Franklin that was invested 200 years earlier. He was a planner. Now, wait a minute. Uh, you can be a planner, but not relying on God and not trusting in God. After a while, that becomes very ineffective. And I'm so afraid because we are Western citizens that we get so hung up on relying on us. I mean, come on, after all, don't get me wrong when I say this, but most people that live in Western civilization, they believe they're good. We don't have any problems. We take care of problems. We not only take care of problems in the U.S., we take care of problems all over the world. If there's a country that is lacking liberty, we can go in and take care of it. Now, there's a problem with that. It's called pride. There's a problem with that. It's called self-reliant. Now, I think we ought to do that. I thank God for every man that's in the military. I thank God for those that are fighting for the cause of truth and righteousness and freedom. But can I tell you tonight, don't ever get to the point, to the place where you rely on you because the arm of the flesh shall fail you. Man, don't rely on you in rearing your children. Don't rely on you in uh, having that relationship with your husband or wife. Don't rely on you in building friendships. You do not know enough. I'm saying tonight that a tested faith brings a depth of character. A tested faith enables us to comfort and encourage others. A tested faith increases our dependence on the wisdom of God. A tested faith, listen, I'm almost done, encourages us to lead a profitable and effective life. Now, by the way, that's according to God's view. I am not supposed to come up with my own prescription as to what a profitable and effective life is. No, I'm supposed to be a vessel in the hands of the master. How many times have I seen people do this? You know, we have some people who come to our church, and I said this, I believe in Sunday school, and they stay with us for a lifetime. We have other people who come to church, and they stay with us for years. We have other people who come to church, and they stay just a short amount of time. Now, wait a minute. While they're here, I do hope that we can allow ourselves to be used, to be able to help them to understand how they can be productive in Christ. Not inside themselves, but in Christ. Because if they don't get it when they leave, or your child yet doesn't get it before they go off the college somewhere, can I tell you, if they don't get it, what takes place is they make unwise decisions the rest of the days of their life. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Peter, I read is their text verse, chapter 1 and verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to your knowledge temperance, and to your temperance patience, and to your patience godliness, and to your godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity, but it doesn't stop there. Look at verse 8, 2 Peter 1, 8. For if these things be in you and abound, the Bible says they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said these things not only need to be in you, they need to abound. Come on. You've heard me say it. You take an orange and you squeeze it, depending on what's in the orange, comes out. When you're under pressure and somebody squeezes you, what comes out of you is the real you. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, but if you lack these things, it says, listen to it now, but if you lack these things, he, it says, but he that lacketh these things is blind. So when a person's not adding to their faith, they're not concentrating on this, they're blind, they can't see. The Bible says, and cannot see afar off, so they lose their vision. Okay, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Here's a person down praying. I mean, they're down praying, man. They're just kneeling and they're praying, dear God, please. Da, 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 da. Somebody comes up, they have their hand down out of meanness. They take a hammer, and as hard as they can, they hit one of those fingers. You say, that's not right. Sometimes people do things that are not right. 
but they hit one of those fingers. Now watch this. All of a sudden, they lose concentration about what they were praying about. Would you agree? That's what happens to you when you get hit broadside. And if you're not careful, what you do is you look at this and say, ah, ah, and you're spending so much time, ah, ah, that you forget him. Because this has got your attention. I know what you got to be careful about is when these things get your attention right here, that you do not lose sight of the one that can help you. Amen. See, here's the thing. You get, ah, go run into your wife. Ah, and your fingers, and your wife says, I love you. I'll pray for you. That's not what you wanted. You wanted your wife to touch it, boom, and all of a sudden it's, it's well, because my wife has the touch. I mean, I mean, or you want your wife to be tender and delicate. Oh, sweetheart, I love you. Ah! I love you. Calm down. Ah! Because this has your total attention. You ever see a Walmart brat? You ever see him? Walmart brat. I want it. I want it. Parent says, no. They're saying it with great control. No. I want it. No. I want it. No. What happened? Kid controlled the parent. They took their eyes off of the way they should have behaved and allowed the situation to control their behavior. Now, I'm saying this tonight. Here it is, just simple truth. The Bible says, but if he lacked these things, listen to it now, he that lacketh these things is blind. They cannot see afar off. They have forgotten, listen to it now, that he was purged from his old sin. Oh, man, they, they forgot how they were delivered. I'm going to help you tonight. Listen, not everybody that hurts you intends to hurt you. <clears throat> you as husbands, do not raise your hand. But have you ever said something to your wife that you regretted? You as wives, don't raise your hand. Have you ever said something to your husband that you regretted? You as children, you as teenagers... You always say stuff to your parents <laughs> that everybody regrets. No, I'm kidding. But I'm saying this. I'm saying a, a test of faith encourages us to lead. And let me give you just two more and I'm done. Here it is. A, a test of faith helps us to identify with Christ. Let, I'm going to give it to you. I'm, I'm quick. Here it is. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. The Bible says, then was Jesus led up, it says, of the Spirit into the wilderness. You mean God will lead you into a wilderness? That's what he did to his own son. Why do you think you're better? Well, you know, I deserve. Yeah, you do. You deserve hell. So do I. If I got what I deserved, I'd burn today. You would be right beside me. The Bible says here, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. By the way, that's where Jesus, if you would please, faced that which was the devil himself. Moses, when he was led into the wilderness, that's where God built his faith. It's in the wilderness. The Bible says, was led up, it says, of the spirit into the wilderness. Now why? To be tempted of the devil. You mean the Holy Spirit of God led Jesus up into the wilderness. So that he could be there and face the devil himself. Wow. Ah! But Jesus had enough common sense that when the devil came to him, he said, it is written. You didn't see him lose control. You didn't see him say, oh, I'll tell you. There's no shouting involved. It's just a simple truth. I'll give you this and I'm done. Here it is. I said, a tested faith brings a depth of character. A tested faith enables us to comfort and encourage others. 
A tested faith increases our dependence on the wisdom of God. A tested faith encourages us to lead a productive and effective life. A test of faith helps us to identify with Christ. Last one and I'm done. A tested faith allows us to focus on our future hope in Christ. You know, I, I, ooh. you know what? There's no reason for a child of God ever to be discouraged. You know why? Heaven. Heaven. He said, preacher, it's bad down here. I'm just here for a little while. I'm passing through heaven. Heaven. Oh, but preacher, I'm under so much pressure. Heaven. Heaven's a wonderful place filled with God's glory and grace. Listen to it, and I'm done. Romans chapter 8, verse 22, the Bible says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together unto now. So now you've got the creation that is groaning for relief. That's not going to happen. Until the Lord returns. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 23, the Bible says, and not only they, but we are, but it says uh, ourselves also uh, that have the first fruits of the Spirit. It says, we uh, ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit. It says the redemption of the body. Now, wait a minute, watch this. And so inside of us, come on now, we have that flesh and we have that spirit. And they just pull. Okay, come here, come here. Don't, don't hurt my shoulder, but come here. And you come too. So here I am, I'm man. I hear the preaching of the word of God. Here's my flesh. Take it. Here's my spirit. I hear the preaching of the word of God. I've got a choice. Now what do I do? Do I go to the spirit? Do I go to the flesh? Okay. You got a choice. Every time you hear truth, Amen. what do you do? Do you say, okay, here's what I'm, I'm going to obey God. Doesn't matter what the flesh wants. I'm going to obey God. And so I try to go over here. But the problem is flesh doesn't let loose. It does not let loose. Now, by the way, listen to me. I don't care who you are. You deal with what I deal with. You deal with what missionaries and evangelists and preachers. Look, they don't walk around with a halo. These are not perfect people. And they got problems just like you have problems. And so there's the preaching of the word of God. And preacher gets up and preacher preaches something. Hey! And all of a sudden you want to do it, don't you? You're like I am. And you just want to do it. Let's do it. And you start to walk towards that which is the spirit. And that flesh just won't let go. By the way, it will never let go. Now, what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to submerge it. Bible calls it mortify. I'm supposed to put it to death. That's what I'm supposed to do. So I'm supposed to, with the power of the Spirit, come over and put the death on the flesh. And Sorry, I broke his glasses. No, I didn't. I, but I'm supposed to take that and mortify it. I'm supposed to bury it. Bury it. So that this has preeminence. Now this is always going to pop up. Come on. Thank you. Every single one of us has problems with weight. When I was a track and field runner, I, I did some field events and I ran track. Mike Wright was our coach. And almost every single time that we practiced, we practiced with weights. I mean, we put the weights on. We put the, the five five pound weights on the ankles, five pound weights on the wrist, 20 pound weight jacket. And we would, and he would make us run. Now we wouldn't sprint with those things on, but he would make us do the practice runs and stuff like that. Now wait a minute, watch this if you will. You know what that did? That stretched those muscles to a place they've never been stretched before. Never been stretched before. When Wade Wagner and I would go to the weight barn, and I'm just giving you examples, we'd go to the weight barn. That was that barn that they called the weight barn. It's very intelligent. And, uh, and so we'd go to weight barn, and Wade and I work out three days a week. Wade would get down on the bench press. I said, come on, Wade, you do it. Push it, push it. I said, push it. Don't you give up. Push it. I'd push him. Then I'd really try to help him. I'd take this finger, this finger, put it under there. I'm helping you now. 
So, I'm helping you now. That's why these are so thick. That's why. I'm helping you. And I'd help him a little bit. I'd holler. I'd scream. I'd, I'd shout. I'd motivate him. Poor guy. He's shorter than I was. He'd be down on the weight up bench. Ah! Oh, ah! Oh, I don't think I can make it. You can make it. Don't you give up. One more. One more. One more. Push it. I'd push him. He'd finally get it up. He'd take it down. I said, come on, let's do another one. Oh. <laughs> you know, sometimes preaching is that way, isn't it? Sometimes preaching gets up and preacher gets up. Hey, read that Bible. Hey, you can do it. Read one more chapter. Come on, get closer to God. Pass out one more track. By the way, that's not bad for you. It's better than your wife sitting at the table saying, come on, honey, eat that food. Come on, just one more tablespoon. Come on, made ham just for you. Eat your ham. I'm saying this, here it is, I'm done. This fellow by the name of John Newton. Wicked, immoral, unconverted. Hated Christianity. He was very active in the slave market, had many slaves. By the way, later on he came back and he worked harder than anybody else that was in his area to outlaw slavery. But Newton was on his way home from England, coming home from Africa. He was on his way home. Storm hit the side of the ship. He cried out for mercy. He got saved on that ship, so he says. Came back later on, became a, a faithful, faithful pastor in England. He wrote a poem. Later on, it was turned into a hymn called Amazing Grace. We sing it here in our church. As he got older, he lost his sight, completely blind, completely deaf. People would say to Mr. Newton, as they would try to get across to him, asking the question, why you keep going? Why you keep going? By the way, you ever, you ever read the last word and testimony of some people? You know what his last word was on his dying bed? Amen. That's his last word. Just simple. Amen. A friend visited him one day and said this. Said, uh, so why is it that you just keep going? You're an old friend. Why you keep going? You can't see. You can't have hear. He said, my memory also, don't forget, he says to his friend, is nearly gone. But I remember two things. Number one, I'm a great sinner. Number two, I have a great Savior. Amen. And by the way, that will help you to be able to go when it seems like everything is pulling on you. See, sometimes a preacher would get up and say, hey, you can do it. You can raise a godly family. Yes, you can. Meet with God. Get God's wisdom. Let God help you. God wants to help you. Sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need just to get along with the Lord and say, Lord, you're a great Savior. I don't want to let you down. So God, would you give me what I need on the inside to be able just to continue? You'll be amazed what God will do if we just ask him to do it. You can continue when your faith, if ever, is challenged. Father, help us tonight, I do pray.